Aina, and welcome to Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future, brought to you by the Kauai Foundation. I'm Ehuke Kahu Cardwell, and here we are today out in Kapolei at the University of Hawaii West Oahu campus. And I'll tell you this right now, we have a very interesting guest on the show. So what do you say? We go on over here and meet her, Elise. Aloha. Thank you for coming. Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet Elise, you, Elise. Elise, introduce yourself to everybody. Aloha. I'm Elise Lemo Medela Cruz Talbert. I am a doctoral student in epidemiology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And I have completed my practicum here at the University of Hawaii West Oahu campus. So that's why we're here today to wow. take a look. Wow. And what is, say that E word again. Epidemiology. And tell us what epidemiology is. I'd be happy to. So epidemiology is a study of risk factors and patterns for disease, health, and mortality. So really what we're doing is we're looking at a population and tracking the things that make them sick um, to understand who's getting sick, why they're getting sick, and to make recommendations about how to keep our populations healthy. So it really is um, a lot of research and evaluation of our environment and people's behaviors and health outcomes. Wow, and so we're standing in a beautiful garden out here today, aren't we? Yes. And tell us why we're here. We're here at the University of Hawaii West Oahu Student Organic Farm because they have just recently started a program in sustainable community food systems. And part of my interest as a student in public health and as, a, and as an epidemiologist is looking at the role of our food choices uh -huh. in our health outcomes, especially diseases like obesity and diabetes and some cancers. This program here, this garden, um, is a part of a sustainable community food systems degree that students can take and in addition to learning about healthy food systems and things like gardening and organic gardening, I was able to participate and to teach them about health trends in our community, um, to let them know that certain races, such as Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, have higher rates for obesity and diabetes and some cancers. And a lot of that is a part of the way that we grow our food, the types of food that are advertised, the types of food that are available in our communities, through the restaurants, through stores. So we're trying to tie in through some of the classes that are being offered here, this idea that community health can be supported through local sustainable agriculture. So wow. this garden is just kind of a microcosm wow. for doing that. So epidemiology, it sounds like epidemiology, what you're studying and becoming an expert in, is very closely connected to this. It's the other side of the coin, yes? It is, This exactly. is about how to keep from getting sick. Yes. And you're studying who and where and why they're getting sick. Yes. So hopefully that can be turned around by this, yeah? That's exactly it, and that's wow. exactly why I was so excited to be a part of this, is because I have to focus with my skill sets on the ways that people are getting sick and what their risk factors are, but programs like this are the solution. And so we have to you know, build and bridge these types of studies working together so that we're studying uh, how people are getting sick, but we're also supporting programs and people that are keeping our community healthy. To prevent them from getting sick. To prevent them from even getting sick, wow. exactly. Super, exactly. so can you give us a tour of the garden here? I'd love to. Super, so first of all, what is this? This is a hale, huh? This is our hale, and it's pretty new. I believe it's a year old or so, and it was sponsored by Kamehameha Schools. But it's basically an, a resource for the campus and for the program where people can meet and do workshops or just even enjoy the view and I helped to co-teach a course here uh, provided a nice place for us to conduct some of the classes so that students were closer to Aina when we were talking about it and they were closer to food when we we're talking about food so part of the type of education that we um, presented them is that there are a lot of recommendations on uh, how to eat healthy and the types of food we should be eating like we should be eating more vegetables and fruits and less fried things and less processed things and for a lot of us we know that and it's so common sense but we still don't make these choices and a lot of times it's because our lives have prevented us from being close to the land and close to the food that is nourishing for us 
So it's really nice to have this hale where we can talk about those issues, but actually have students see food that's healthy and sometimes touch it for the first time or learn about it for the first time. And even for myself, I've learned about vegetables here in this garden that I didn't know existed before I came here. So that's one of the things that can happen here in the hale. Wow, so the students come out here, they get to sit in the shade. Yeah. <laughs> while, you, while you guys teach them, they learn. And then they come outside the hale, the house, and here are all the different crops out here. Exactly, so, exactly. So show us what different crops you have out here. We have like uwala growing here. So this is sweet potato. Sweet potato, uh -huh. yes. And of course we have some kalo, some jailan kalo here. And yep. I believe that a lot of um, different organizations and people donated the seeds and the plants here to help get it started. So I heard of Ted Radovich from UH CTAR donated some kalo and uh, Ma'o Farms helped to donate some of the seedlings. So it really was a community effort to get all of this in here. And we have a lot of the new greens that I'm new with, the types of lettuces, banana trees surrounding the area for some crop cover. Because it's using, you know, and I'm learning about this as I'm a part of what they're doing here, but it's trying to use more traditional methods to deal with soil um, quality and crop cover. So this is an organic garden. They have the plants that are mixed up so that you have nitrogen fixers with the plants that need nitrogen and you have this natural crop cover from the banana trees. And that's supposed to be, you know, a healthier way for you to have this diversified garden. Wow. So they're doing it the way they used to do it in ancient Hawaii, yes? In the old ways. It's a mix. I would say it's a mix of what they did in pre-contact Hawaii and what we do now in terms of what we grow because we have new foods here. But it is, it's, it is utilizing so much traditional knowledge, but also to grow new foods. So students are here at the college year-round taking classes. Yes, There's they no are. such thing as a summer break where everybody goes home <laughs> and there's nothing growing here. Not for some, not for some of them, not for some of us, yeah. Wow. So they're, they are maintaining it during the summer as well. Some of the students work to create the seedlings ah. and some plant starters. Wow. So part of the gardening program that they do um, is, you know, in addition to working with people to teach them gardening skills, is sometimes being able to give away some plant starters. So wow. we have a lot of things going on over here. And here they are right here. Some yes. Here's some of the plant starters. Yes. <laughs> Look at that. Do you have any idea what kind of plant that is? I'm going to try and read this thing. Here's the cheat sheet right here. There it is. Pine Iron Pea. We'll be having a, some peas to eat soon. Peas, wow. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So basically, they start here, mm -hmm. all along on these shelves here, mm -hmm. under the netting, and then when they get large enough, they get transferred out here. With all the TOC of our garden staff <laughs> <laughs> and volunteers that come out here. I'm in epidemiology because I got interested in health disparities, particularly in the lens of why Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders we're in the news so much for having higher obesity rates or higher diabetes rates or even um, worse social outcomes like lower graduation rates from high school and college and income levels. All these things affect our health. Uh -huh. And recently there's been a lot of research on what we call the social determinants of health. And that's looking at the different environmental factors, not just like the earthy environment, but also where people work, where they go to school, um, the parks that they play or don't play in, mm. and even things like your retail food environment, your advertising mm. environment, all those things they're finding affects our health behaviors. Say more about that, why? Well, so, you know, where we live has such a strong influence on the choices we can make throughout life and a lot of influence on our health behaviors, but all behaviors. And so, for example, um, in a study that I helped to do with the Department of Health, they looked at all the zip codes on Oahu, and I believe there are 26. And then they looked at smoking rates, diabetes rates, obesity rates, poverty level, um, education, and diet, like whether or not they ate five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. And what we did is we looked at the percentages 
of all of these types of behavioral outcomes and ranked the zip codes by which ones were doing better and worse and that sort of thing. And in uh, that one study, I, it kind of like woke me up and a light went on because Waimanalo, Kahuku, and Waianae had the worst health outcomes and the worst indicators across of the board. Why? And so the why is the why behind that is what I'm studying. Like, why is it that certain communities have such drastic health disparities? Uh, we have guesses, we can guess, and I have hypotheses. So those communities have higher rates of poverty. They have more Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations. Um, they may be more rural or socially isolated from the town. And those sort of things cannot influence our identity, but also um, our behavior. And very specifically to my research, the types of food you buy or you cook at home or you share with your family. So what my research is trying to get at is if we look at health disparities from the lens of what are the social determinants of health, what types of environments are people growing up in? What types of influences in our environment might affect our health behaviors? Um, I'm trying to ask that question of why do people in these communities in particular, but across all of Oahu and all of Kauai, why do these people maybe have barriers to eating healthy or to making good choices? And does it have to do with, for example, in the um, in the area of food choice, is it because in their neighborhood they only have fast food restaurants or are liquor stores readily available? And um, is it difficult for them to go to a grocery store? Do they need a car? Do they need, you know, financial help to afford healthy food? And so this type of study can be, um, it can be challenging because it's not easy to tie these things together. It's not easy like the way if you have an infectious disease, a mosquito bites you, and then you know that you have a disease from the mosquito like one week later. With chronic diseases, they occur over time. And so they occur over our life, you know, our, our lifetime and our, they're determined by our lifestyle, mm -hmm. not one event or like one contact. So they're harder to measure, but they're also harder to convince people to change <laughs> because you can't just help them once to yeah. make a healthy choice and yeah. to like eat healthy or to not smoke that day or you know all of these other health issues you have to give them a reason to be healthy for their lifetime or them or their families so a lot of what the social determinants of health try to get us to do and researching that is how do we basically create communities where healthy choices are the norm, yes. and where they're easier to make than unhealthy choices. We've talked a lot about the problems that you discover in surveys, mm -hmm. and we've also talked about some of the solutions. But what I'd like to ask you now is, how did you get in this? What made you so excited that you wanted to jump in this and have this be your focus of not only your dissertation, but it sounds to me like your life work, yeah? That, that does feel like it sometimes. Um, I, would, I would have to say that I grew up in a family that was really big. And How that, big? My mom had nine brothers and sisters. Wow. I'm the oldest of four girls. And my grandparents took it upon themselves to keep the house open to their nieces and nephews. So I kind of grew up in this family where it was normal that you found ways to take care of each other and that you... Um, valued the well-being of others as much as your own. So that was a big part of it and I think that was the, very formative in my character and personality. And then um, I actually got my bachelor's degree in biology with a focus on genetics and development from Cornell University. And at the time I thought I wanted to study genetics and do research on how genetics plays a role in our health outcomes. And really, there was a lot of exciting buzz 
around 2000, dating myself, but around the year 2001, there was a company called Genentech that published the first human genome. And that was supposed to be like revolutionizing science and even potential for medicine. And it was really exciting, I think, to think about the role that science and geneticists could have in helping to solve all of these health issues and promote health and longevity and all these things. So I went through that training and I definitely learned a lot about the biology of things and I will never, um, I think, regret majoring in that. But coming from Hawaii and from the communities that I came from and grew up in Kaneohe, and the issues that I saw were, they were more real than it seemed what I could do in a lab doing so, genetic research. While you were back at Cornell, you never forgot your experience of growing up in this large extended family yes. is what you're saying. Yes, and, wow. and also seeing that um, they were having health issues. Hmm. My mom had cancer twice. She's, she survived, so we're very thankful for that. But she had cancer twice as a young Hawaiian woman. And, you know, that is not an isolated incident. Cancer rates among Pacific Islanders or cancer mortality among Pacific Islanders is higher than cancer mortality for other ethnic groups here. And that, as well as obesity and diabetes, are all tied into the types of lifestyles we lead. Mm -hmm. And so seeing, you know, in general, all these health disparities, research that we have nationally, that minorities and low income people, um, even people who have other disadvantages, like maybe due to their sexual orientation or living in the rural area versus the urban area. We have all these different groups who are disadvantaged, who have less access to resources, systematic barriers to living a good life. And then specifically, I had this experience in my family, seeing people in my family go through a lot of different health issues. And so when I came to public health, it was kind of wanting to combine my interest in research and my understanding of genetics and development with what are the social forces that are driving, that are causing, that are causing yeah. these health behaviors. Yeah. And I, I do think that, of course, science plays, continues to play a role in what we can achieve to address people's health. But so much, um, so much of what, about what we know about health is very basic and easy. You should exercise <laughs> and you should eat healthy. And the World Health Organization defines health as not the mere absence of disease, but it's total social, mental, and physical well-being, which is something that resonates with me as Hawaiian. Very holistic, this, yeah? There's a holistic understanding of what is pono and what is health. And isn't that the way the ancient Hawaiians operated? And that, yes. that was their mindset? Yes. That everything was connected to each other and nothing was separate. Exactly. And that you can't treat the body yeah. and expect someone to be healthy. You can't just treat their mind and yeah. not consider their relationships to other people. Yeah. And so... We know this. I mean, general society knows these knows these things, and so it just seems like, what's the holdup? You know, like we know all of this. Like, why aren't we practicing it? And I just think we need more people, uh, more people in younger generations to push for um, to push for society that we want to live in, and because we have to push against those capitalistic forces those forces that are kind of driven towards not valuing life and the environment and all the things that are part of that holistic health structure. Um, and we have to be willing to stand up for those things. Okay, so were those things the things that drove you into the area you're in now? Yes, I would say that because I could see that in particular food has a big, um, food has a big effect on obviously our health outcomes because we have a obesity epidemic mm -hmm. and we have growing rates of diabetes and certain cancers that are related to health diseases. But it's also a really good way, food is also a really good window to look at how societal forces have affected the way we live. So why don't we eat healthy, you know, just all the time in Hawaii because our ancestors actually eat healthy. They had a very balanced diet and active lifestyle. And what has changed and what are the new barriers? And we know that our food system was colonized 
that we went from growing our own food and having diversified agriculture that looks like this garden to having um, mono farms, growing sugar, and then growing- Only one crop. One crop, yeah. mono crop farms yeah. that were going to be a commodity shipped other places, not mm -hmm. food for the community. Yeah. And so we transitioned to that when we were colonized. And uh, we took away, or they took away, and you know we lost some of our food security because of that. And so now Hawaii imports 80 to 90 percent of its food. And we have access to healthy food through the grocery stores, but can everyone afford those healthy foods if they're more expensive? Mm -hmm. And then if they're healthy foods that are not culture appropriate, is that enough? So some of the issues around, um, some of the issues around food touches upon culture, and access to land, which is really also a social justice issue in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about food and you bring people together around food, you can get them, I think, to think about all of these issues at the same time. Hawaii has the potential to be a model for sustainable farming. We have a combination of our ancestral knowledge and traditional farming methods, but also people who are drawn to Hawaii because we care about Aina here and because they want to be a part of that kind of community that malamas Aina. And so we can combine all of these old knowledges and new knowledges towards a sustainable, um, locally community-driven food system. My work is going to be through health in the sense that I feel like my job and my role is to keep measuring and capturing and bringing attention to whatever forces are barriers to that. So if price is an issue, then how do we think about as a society how to offer affordable healthy foods? If access is an issue because we're not allowing communities and schools to grow their own food, then how do we improve that? How do we get people back on the land in a lo'i or in a, a fish pond? And what are the policies or programs that we need to do things like that? So I would hope that I can continue to work in that way because I do love, I do love science and research. I do love stats and modeling and all those things, but there are people who are building gardens or they're, um, they're reviving all of these traditional food ways, which is, I have to admit, not my expertise, but there's value in that, and I see that value, and I want to support it with what my skill sets are. Mm -hmm. So I think that as, um, as I complete my degree, I, and as I have been in school, I have been meeting a lot of people who are also just completely dedicated to reviving traditional and indigenous food systems in Hawaii and looking at sustainability from both a better economic standpoint and better health standpoint and a better cultural um, standpoint. And I think that what I would love to see is just more transdisciplinary efforts so that we're learning from each other and that we're working together towards what is a very large goal to basically overturn and to change the way that our food system is in Hawaii so that it's locally driven again. Great. And it's a huge thing. It's a huge undertaking. It is a huge <laughs> undertaking. All right, Elise. I know somebody's probably watching you and me right now. Maybe somebody who isn't in the best of health. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody who has much more weight on them than they would like to have. Maybe somebody who has said to themselves, I would really like to do what I hear her saying, mm -hmm. but I've tried and tried, mm -hmm. and I just can't get myself to do it. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Well, I think that small changes are just undervalued when we're trying to change. And for myself, I actually also got to like 200 pounds when I was in college. Really? And that maybe was part of why I think that people can change and we can help people because I did do it for myself. So I would say that small changes um, in terms of what you're eating, like cutting out one bad thing, like cutting out soda or juice that doesn't actually have any juice in it. And just starting there is a good way to start and expecting 
um, s a slow changes to your weight and how you feel is just also a better way to um, be successful and to feel successful and to like allow yourself to make these changes over time because we're going against years of habit. We have to acknowledge that like when you start a habit, you get used to it, but the people around you get used to your habits. And then when you change, you have to change everything. You have to change what you do, but you have to change what other people do sometimes too around you. So don't give up. I would say don't give up and keep going with small goals. Wow, yeah. wonderful, wonderful answer. Elise, and that's where we have to leave it. Mahalo for being on Voices Thank of you. Truth. Thank you for giving us your wonderful message. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't stop because I know you're going to be out there making an impact, helping people to not only eat healthier, feel healthier, but also grow their own garden just like we have here today. That would be yeah? great. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> and to our viewers, mahalo to you for joining me and Elise out here in this wonderful West Oahu campus of University of Hawaii. Remember, you can watch us on the web 24-7 on VoicesOfTruthTV.com and you can like Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future on Facebook. I'm Ehu Kahu Cardwell for the Kauani Foundation with Elise right here. And until next time, ahui ho! Mahalo for watching Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. Watch us on the web 24-7 at VoicesOfTruthTV.com. You'll find all our shows, including this one, in case you want to see it again or share it with family and friends. Also view our weekly video commentaries at FreeHawaiiTV.com. And check out our blog, published daily, at FreeHawaii.info. It's all part of the Free Hawaii Broadcasting Network.